Greetings, everyone. Uh, please take your seats and get some of your uh, lunch. And uh, we have a very interesting hour of discussion ahead of us. My name is James Fallows. I'm a writer for The Atlantic Magazine, a veteran of uh, Ideas Festival since their, uh, their inauguration, and very excited to be back here again. I'm especially pleased about the session we have ahead of us for this next hour here in uh, Indoor Hozier with Doug Douglas McMillan from Walmart, who is the president and CEO of Walmart International, which has 5,000 stores around the world, and how many uh, associates there? We've got about 2.2 million associates, over 10,000 stores around the world, and only my grandmother calls me Douglas, so okay. Doug would be good. I will call you Doug from now on. I'm, I'm getting old in many ways, but the category of your grandmother is one I think I will avoid for, avoid for now. And before that, you were the leader of Sam's Club for three years, and uh, you can tell us how you started with Walmart almost 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I first started with the company as a teenager, yeah. Um, unloading trucks in one of our warehouses and then got into our management training program, worked in one of our stores and then became a buyer in 1991 and moved into our home office. And my observation is that is a typical rather than an atypical story for a lot of Walmart uh, leadership, isn't it? People it is. Who work their way up. Yeah, the a career pathing at Walmart is a big deal. As you know, we've grown our business and need great store managers, great leaders, and it's, it's uh, most productive and effective to find them within our own ranks and develop our own talent. Right. So the context of our discussion here is a number of programs in this Ideas Festival about addressing the nine billion. As the world's population goes up, as cities spring up around the world, as environmental pressures grow, as food pressures grow, as social changes emerge, as women take on uh, different roles, and as uh, minorities are uh, in, yeah, integrated in different ways around the world, we're looking at the institutions that address that. And you could make the case that if any institution based in the United States, Walmart plays a bigger role in dealing with the outside world than any other. The U.S. military would probably be the second in quite a different sort of uh, interaction with the world. But in your role as, as Walmart International, you see uh, the ways in which people's purchasing uh, habits are changing. You've seen the role the company has in, in, in the environment. In the last few years I've been living in China, I've been dramatically impressed by the impact of Walmart in a, in a force for environmental good around the world. And we had an article by Orville Schell in The Atlantic a couple months ago on exactly that point of how changes in your supply chain had been re really radically effective in reducing uh, pollution and worker safety issues, et cetera, in, in China. We're going to talk about things like that, also the effect on the United States. I'm going to start with two topical questions for you. And I'll tell everybody here, we'll talk for maybe half of the allotted time, and I'll turn it over to all of you in the audience for questions. First one is, as you know, two hours ago, three hours ago, the Supreme Court gave its relatively surprising ruling on the Obama health care proposal. Health care and its costs are enormous issues for big corporations. They've been somewhat controversial issues for Walmart. Does anything about this ruling make life different for you in Walmart? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, we engaged early on in the health care debate that was occurring and recognized that we needed to and, and have a voice in the subject, mainly because the system that we had was not sustainable, wasn't sustainable for our associates or employees, wasn't sustainable for employers, and wasn't sustainable from a competitive point of view for the country. So we support change, and uh, the, the one piece of, of work that we think still needs to be a key area of focus is just cost management. Um, sustainability is the issue. So. Um, as with every other business, I suppose, mm -hmm. we've been planning for this outcome and are, are set to, to execute. And, and can I ask, as you were planning for the outcome and you had your different plans, A, B, and C, is this one more or less disruptive for you than other alternatives, say, say if the mandate had been overturned? Yeah, um, probably on the less side. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, this will adjust the marketplace and we'll adjust with it. Yeah, so the headline here, if any of you are tweeting, is Walmart endorses Obamacare. That's what we're going to hear. <laughs> Thank so, you, Jim. Yeah. And, and anytime. Thank you very anytime. much. I did not say that. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was in the joshing mode. Uh, the other topical issue I need to ask you about, which is much more directly Walmart-centric, in the last couple of months there have been a number of very high-profile stories led by the New York Times about Walmart's problems in Mexico mm -hmm. and with uh, bribery accusations in Mexico. How should we think about these revelations about Walmart, what the company, how you think they happened, what the company is doing about them now? Yeah, well, it's obviously a very serious issue, and we're treating it as, as such. And we won't tolerate a lack of FCPA compliance anywhere in the world or at any level of the company. The investigation that's going on is independent, and it'll take time. Um, we, are, we are dedicated to making sure that's the best possible investigation it can be and that it is independent. And as the facts are clear, 
um, given the allegations that are out there, then we'll deal with them and, and be public about those actions as we can be public about them. But as a leader in Walmart, mm -hmm. one of the things that I get the opportunity to do is to make sure that we take advantage of this environment and this opportunity to get even stronger in compliance across the board. Um, in the area of FCPA specifically, um, not only in Mexico, but in other markets, we've been in, uh, strengthening our processes. We've changed some of the things about how we audit. Um, there's been a lot of training for thousands of people all over again relative to FCPA. We've created a structure with an independent FCPA attorney in Mexico that reports directly to corporate, not to someone in Mexico. So we're trying to demonstrate through our actions what our intentions are and then deliver um, against what's required. But compliance is a big issue for us right. as a company. 27 countries, we deal with everything from fire safety to food safety in China and other markets. And what we're trying to do now is to make sure that all of our training and processes and the other things that we have to have in place are as strong as they can possibly be. Yep. And just to follow up this theme for a moment, sometimes when there's a scandal of some sort or a violation that's, that's uh, uncovered in any part of the, the world, people see it as a kind of standalone aberration and think, how could that have happened? On the other hand, for example, with the recent scandals in China, with the Bushy Lai case and all the rest, people say this is the tip of the iceberg, and if you unveil one, there's a whole lot more to be found. Within the company, what are the reasons that would make you think this is a standalone case in Mexico? Or, or were there circumstances about Mexico which would make this more likely there yeah. than other, other parts of the world? Well, let's start with organizational culture. Yeah. Um, earlier in a session, we were talking about the culture of, of uh, academic institutions, but it, culture matters, and culture matters within Walmart. Our purpose is to save people money so they can live better. Our culture is based on four core values, and they go back to Sam Walton. Um, Walmart culture gets talked uh, about a lot. Let me take just a minute and try to explain my perspective on it. There are four core values that we have. We respect the individual, we strive for excellence, we serve the customer, all on a foundation of integrity. And when you think about why those values matter in our business, you could think about it as a customer shopping in a Walmart store. How do you want to be treated by an associate in one of our stores? You want to be respected, you want them to strive for excellence, you want them to have a service mentality and serve the customer. And our founder, Sam Walton, understood that if he didn't have those behaviors, mm -hmm. associates wouldn't have those behaviors. And that's true for the leaders in the company mm -hmm. today. So what I can tell you from my position is that our culture is strong. We're, we have a very strong organizational right. culture. It's as strong today as it has been, and we're investing to make it even stronger. Reaching 2.2 million people mm -hmm. is, it requires repetition. Um, it requires work, and, and we're focused on that. It's important to us. As I travel around the world, I spend a lot of time talking about organizational culture. So will there be issues that'll pop up? I'm sure there will. We're in 27 countries. We have 2.2 million people. How we handle them and how we make sure that we don't have the same ones over and over again is, is what I'm focused on. Right. Good. And a word about Walmart culture. Uh, by chance, one of, uh, one of our, um, our family's sons uh, spent about a year in Bentonville working on a consulting project with Walmart. Went down to see, to see some of these uh, Saturday meetings at Walmart. It was a very, very impressive uh, culture that I, I think you should make more and more people available to go see those meetings. Uh, can you fun. say a word about them, about the Saturday meetings? Yeah, um, communication is important in a people business like ours. And, and Sam started a Saturday morning meeting and he felt like if the stores were open on Saturday and our associates are working on Saturday, the management team should be working on Saturday. So they'd show up early in the morning, they'd cover the sales numbers, they'd talk about business, we'd talk about items merchandising, and then if there was time left over, the, the suits would go out and unload trucks at our warehouse, which was next to the home office until noon. Now today, I don't unload trucks till noon on Saturday, but you understand the spirit of it. Yeah. And we still get together on Saturday mornings, we do it once a month, and we have similar meetings in our markets around the world that are fun, they're interactive, a lot of, of discussion, we talk about merchandise, mm -hmm. and we try to perpetuate culture. It's a big part of what we talk about on Saturdays. I'd like to now talk about the sort of connection between Walmart as a quintessentially American institution in its culture, in its uh, roots in, in Arkansas, and your spread around the world. When I was living in China, I was impressed by how localized the Walmart stores were there. We'd have pig carcasses hanging from the roof and tanks full of live fish and, and the rest. And I'm wondering how you have managed the, to, to have the uh, sort of split consciousness of an American brand, American practices, and the things that are good about Ameri Walmart's American identity, and the localization that's necessary in Europe or Latin America or the Far East to be successful. Yeah, it's a big part of our leadership yeah. challenge. I mean, if you think about what people want to buy in Shanghai, it's different than what they want to buy in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. 
And so what we have are local teams making those decisions, so Chinese buyers for Chinese customers, and most of what we buy is local. Mm -hmm. And most of our markets, maybe all of our markets, the percentage that we purchase is about 90% local. We get better lead times, you get product that's more relevant, and so you just have this natural occurrence. And what we're trying to work through is we, we want to have some things in common. We want to have a common purpose, the organizational culture is important, and we have six common operating principles that we want every one of our stores and every one of our businesses around the world to operate with. Beyond that, they have a lot of freedom. So this morning I got pictures from Mexico from a super center that we opened in Mexico City yesterday, and they were showing me the items they were featuring and how many they're selling. But they're different than the, than the items that I'm going to find mm -hmm. in China when I'm, when I'm there in a few months. And are there places, where would you say this has worked best in terms of the sweet spot of American identity and local culture, and where are you still having the greatest challenges? Yeah. Most customers have the same... Uh, we, sh we share a lot in common, mm -hmm. and, and I travel a lot. We've got um, stores all over the place, and I get to talk to a lot of customers, sometimes go into their homes, um, sometimes meet them and talk to them in the store. And what I hear about are common things like, I want to save some money because I want to make things better for my family. I want to save enough money so my child can have a better education or so that I can take a vacation, common themes like that. But what they want to buy can be different um, by area. And I think the super centers are a way to think about the commonality to answer your question directly. We have similar look and feel super centers in Brazil, mm -hmm. in Mexico, in China. Um, and that's where we've been able to apply some of the processes that we have here and some of that commonality. Um, in other instances, we, we have lots of stores, in fact, more than a, uh, 10 different formats. You might not even recognize some of them in markets because they're smaller, they might have a different brand name, they might have a cement floor, some of them are air conditioned because they're meet, meeting the need mm -hmm. of a different demographic. They leverage some of the things I just mentioned, but they're also even more unique in the way that they approach their individual customers. Yeah. And maybe we should do a, a poll here. Um, I, I, this is the Aspen Ideas Festival demographic doesn't overlap exactly with the, the normal uh, Walmart purchasing demographic, but how many people have been in a Walmart in the last week? Maybe been in a Walmart in the last week. How many in the, the last month? And so for people who are not familiar <laughs> Jim, with... Jim, most of the people that raise their hand work for Walmart, you say, uh, <laughs> and I'm glad they've been in our stores. Yes. Well, so, so it might be useful for you to spend 30 seconds explaining exactly what a super center looks like <laughs> for those who, and, and if you go around the world and you see these as we have in China, and we've seen them in, other, in Australia, you know, how, what are their distinctive markings? Well, a super center is, is uh, meant to fill a stock up trip. So it's a broad assortment at everyday low prices. It would tend to be a bigger store. They might be larger than 120,000 square feet, for example. And we have a lot of them here in the U.S. and some of the other markets that I mentioned. But we've purchased businesses over the years that have much smaller store yeah. footprints. Um, you know, some of our stores aren't a lot bigger than maybe two times this stage, for mm -hmm. example, and have a much smaller assortment and may be in a different market with a lower income level yeah. than a super center could ever be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's a portfolio management job where we're trying to place different stores. And we actually have over 50 different retail brand names around the world. Mm -hmm. And outside the U.S., we do a lot of business, a majority of our business under brand names that are not Walmart or Sam's Club. Some of that because of the acquisitions that we made. And uh, give us a few illustrations of those, if you would, your yeah, different brand names. Sure. Um, we just uh, purchased a business a couple of years ago in Chile, and the, the format there that would be like a super center is called Leader, L-I-D-E-R, mm -hmm. translated as, as a leader. That's one example. Yeah. Um, let me tell you just a quick story yeah. about that one for fun. Um, after we made the acquisition, I went down to Chile and was talking to a customer on the grocery side of this store, and um, she had a, a child, a little girl in her shopping cart, and, and I walked up with someone assuming that we were gonna need to speak Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, and I said, so would you please ask her what she likes about this store and what she doesn't like about this leader store? And she turned to me in perfect English and said, don't mess this store up. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I live, I, I live here, but I shop in the U.S. sometimes, and I've seen your super centers in Florida, and I like the food in this leader store huh. better than the food in the super center in Florida. And I said, well, that's great, um, but I don't see any uh, non-food or general merchandise or apparel in your cart. Do you buy your electronics here? No. Toys? No. Apparel? No. Yeah. I said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, make, we'll leave food alone or make it a little better, and we'll go work on the other side of the store, and we'll make it better. What do you think? And she said, that's a good idea. 
And sure enough, here two years later, our business on the non-food side of the store is great, and the food business that was there just a couple weeks ago was even even better. So the brand name, you know, mm -hmm. it matters some, but really what matters to customers is they want to find value, they want you to be in stock, they want somebody to serve them with respect, and, and that's true everywhere. Yeah. So turning to our topic of the nine billion emerging world, world population, Walmart, I think, is again uniquely positioned to know about the, the income characteristics, the spending preferences, uh, both in the United States and around the world, of people who aren't always covered by, by the news media. Mm -hmm. And from your international operations, what can you tell us about what you're seeing about the emerging sort of middle class, uh, mm -hmm. upper working class, or whatever, as you're seeing it in China, as you're yeah. seeing it in Latin America, in the Middle East? Are there signs, do you, do you see you know, more and more prosperity coming? What, what do you know yeah. about your customers overseas? Well, as many people in the room probably know, the growth in the middle income in emerging markets is phenomenal. And over the next decade, a lot of numbers get talked about, but the one that, that I remember is about 320 million new middle income households being created in China, India, Brazil, and, and uh, the other emerging markets. So we want to be positioned with stores to serve those customers as they grow. Um, it's, it's stories like in India, a mom who was in one of our stores and wanted to buy um, bedding. She needed an additional bedding set, comforter, pillowcase, stuff like that, because they had just moved into a new apartment, gotten an extra bedroom, and her two sons were now going to have separate rooms, which meant a lot to her. But what was interesting about it is she said, I'm excited about having two bedrooms for the kids because um, they're going to be able to study in peace. And really what she wanted was a better education. Mm -hmm. But she was moving up beyond just buying food and maybe things she had to have needs into some more discretionary stuff um, as she looked around the store. So that kind of customer is happening yeah. around the world. And we have to deliver on a lot of fronts. Um, we've got to deliver uh, as a business financially, mm -hmm. but we've got to deliver socially and environmentally to make sure that people like her can experience what they want to experience. I mean, today, with the 7 billion number in population, so many people around the world with mobile and other things, they know how people here in Aspen are living. Mm -hmm. And they want to live more like that than they are today. Well, to make that possible, um, we have to, and other businesses have to engage um, with NGOs and, in some cases, governments to create a more sustainable mm -hmm. environment socially and environmentally. And, we can talk about that some more yeah. if you want to. And we'll get to that in a second. I have one other sort of customer-based question for you. I think it's a known fact in the United States that, that politicians, if they are shrewd, pay very close attention to the sort of buying behavior of the Walmart population because it's a very important barometer on consumer confidence of yeah. where people are cutting back, uh, where they're, they're starting to spend more. As you use that same kind of barometer, looking at parts of the world that are in the news now, for example, in the Middle Eastern countries, which have had so much turmoil in the last year or so, or in China, where you're having all this concern about growing economic extremes, are there any insights you have from your customer data that would augment what we're reading in the news about either the stability or the uh, non-stability of some of these places? Hey, might start here in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. And you might be surprised to know just how much of our business is still done with cash. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of customers wow. that are unbanked that shop in our stores. And so in a cash environment, gas prices are probably the number one wow. predictor of discretionary spending in our stores here. And we know that when, when gas gets to the 350 range, mm -hmm that we see very different behavior. Yeah. So right now, being around $3, mm -hmm. people are feeling a little relief. They'll, they'll be a, a bit more discretionary in their purchases. But in recent months, I would say maybe pre-Easter, pre we were still seeing a lot of pressure where people were buying smaller pack sizes because they have a lower price point. So instead of something that might actually have a higher value per ounce, they'll buy a smaller size because they literally only have the $1 or $5 yeah. they can spend and it's cash. Um, or they'll reach and buy a private brand because they don't think they can afford the brand mm -hmm. in, here in this country. Um, it's very different by market. Right. In the UK right now, people are feeling a ton of pressure. Mm -hmm. The austerity measures and what's happening in the euro are yeah. creating pressure. China recently has slowed in terms of uh, mm -hmm. consumption and consumer oh. growth. Um, normally, we would see a very robust Chinese New Year period in mm -hmm. January or February. We didn't see that this huh. year. And what I hear from our team there is that, in some ways, Chinese customers now have more information about what's happening around the world, including in, in Europe. And so their conservatism is at least some a reflect, somewhat a reflection of what they hear about the world, not just yeah. what's happening on the ground in China. 
So, you know, the GDP expectations for some markets have changed in, in the last 12 or 24 months, and we see that play out in terms of consumer behavior. Yeah. Now, that's a very interesting point you make about China, one of many, many interesting points uh, you, you make. You know, there's always a great debate about the believability of official Chinese statistics on, uh, you know, economic progress, and so people look for the unfakeable things, like the number of ships that are still sitting in Hong Kong Harbor and the piles of coal outside power plants, and I would think that, that you're purchasing in your stores would be number, another one of those really uh, uh, true barometers that you can't, uh, you can't fake uh, other ways. Uh, let us talk about the social and environmental effect of Walmart around the world. As you're, you're well aware, and I imagine we'll have some questions uh, afterwards, the expansion of Walmart inside the United States has been a continuation of a centuries-long debate in the United States about sort of economic efficiency versus uh, traditional values of one kind or another. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, the expansion of the first supermarkets was very controversial, like Walmart's now, because there were, there were merchants who felt they were being disrupted. And of course, the other side of that is all the benefits that come with new jobs and lower prices and all the rest. As you look at the effect of Walmart overseas, are there similar debates about its social effect? And what is the, the, either the evidence you see or the case you make about positive or even negative effects of Walmart's expansion in other countries. Yeah, um, there definitely are debates around it. Um, recently, we made an investment in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was a debate there. Right now, you, you'll read a lot in India about foreign direct investment of multi-brand retail. That's an ongoing debate. On one side um, sits millions of shopkeepers or Karanas in India. On the other side sits farmers yeah. that really want to reduce the amount of waste on uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, which is supposedly in the 40% range, and they want to make more for their fruits and vegetables, and former retail can help yeah. them do that, and the cold chain needs to be invested in. So it's a very active debate yeah. um, in those markets and around the world. One of the things we point to is actually Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at when we entered in Mexico in 1991, how much of the business was done in the informal market mm -hmm. as opposed to modern retail, um, it hasn't changed very much. There's still over 40% of the retail sales in Mexico were done in an informal market. Mm -hmm. Um, in many instances where there is no tax collection, which means there is no infrastructure developed, um, et cetera. So, you know, it's a, it is a debate, mm -hmm. and we obviously feel like we demonstrate through the actions that we have that we are good for communities and societies and work to prove that to be true all the time. And how about your role as employer o overseas? I'm not talking now about so much about the supply chain mm -hmm. where obviously uh, Walmart all my purchasers have such a huge effect in China and other places, but your role as, as a retail um, force employing associates in the stores, how is that different from their, ex their pre-existing uh, employment opportunities and what sort of, what changes have you seen based on that? Yeah, let me, let me tell yeah. you a quick story about Brazil. Um, there's a, a young lady named Adriana that I met a couple years ago and she was um, inducted into something called the social retail school. She qualified to come to our retail school to learn about business and about retail. She was a, a, a very young person in, a, in an impoverished area of Sao Paulo, didn't have a lot of career opportunities. And by entering the social retail school, she did well in that school. She got an opportunity to become an associate and she's off to a fantastic start. I've, I've now seen her a couple of different times and her career as she refers to it, and her opportunity to now go to school and what she gets with health care benefits mm -hmm. is very different than it would have been if it, if it weren't um, for the retail school and for our business. Um, another story out of, out of India, there's a young lady named Amandeep that I met a few years ago in a town called Amritsar, which is up in the northwestern part of India. And if she were here, what she would tell you is she was in a situation where she was going to have to get married early and would have had a life working um, in the crops in a small mm -hmm. farm. She got an opportunity because we opened a store in her neighborhood, a cash and carry store. She got an opportunity to apply to that. We have a smaller, similar school there to apply to the school. She made it through the school. She got a job. She's now taking her MBA online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her life is dramatically different. And there are large numbers of people that are experiencing that. We're, we're going to grow over the next five years to the point that we'll need to employ another 500,000 mm -hmm. people. A lot of them are international, most of them in stores. And we want well-trained people like Amandeep in the stores. So we make investments to try and create that environment. I'm fascinated that all of these really interesting anecdotes you've told so far have involved women. And I know that, that, that uh, Walmart has, an, probably not known by the general public, one of its missions is, is opportunities for women. Can you say more about that? Sure. Um, 
I think Dr. Gale was here earlier. I see you over here. Um, CARE is one of the organizations yeah. that's helped educate us. And let me just briefly say, I think Walmart went through a transition a few years ago. Um, we believed in the very beginning, as you would expect, that customers and associates were two key stakeholders. Did we care about shareholders? Sure, any mm -hmm. business cares about shareholders, but we, our philosophy was if you focus on associates and they're happy and they do a good job and they have opportunities, mm -hmm. they'll take good care of customers and if customers are happy, your business grows. Sounds pretty simple. But when we became big, whenever that was, we didn't always get the memo on the moment that that occurred, but when we became big, societal expectations were higher than, than what I just described. So we needed help. So starting to listen more um, to people like Dr. Gale and others to say, you need to think differently about the environment, you need to think differently about social issues, has led us to a point where we are today. We're still maturing, but, but we're, we have a different point of view yeah. and perspective than we have before. One of those areas is in the area of women. So we know that women are disproportionately uh, impoverished, disproportionately literate. Um, they have a hard time as entrepreneurs getting access to capital. Mm -hmm. We know what women spend money on typically is more around their children and education and health care than what guys may spend mm -hmm. money on. That matters. I mean, I was in a meeting not too long ago where somebody called investment in women's empowerment is like a global stimulus package. There's some truth in that. And so we've made some commitments about how we source goods, what we ex ex uh, expect from service providers as it relates to female representation. We've made a commitment to train 200,000 people, uh, 200,000 women to enter the, the workforce in retail like some of the young ladies that I just mentioned. And we believe that's a good investment. We're seeing what other companies see in that our representation at the top of the organization has progressed. Mm -hmm. We have a ton of, of representation of women in, in the large numbers yeah. at Walmart. And then we've got this area in the middle and middle management where we're trying to figure out how do you break down barriers so the whole thing works mm -hmm. um, organizationally. And, and that's one of the areas of focus that we have. Let me ask you one cultural point based on uh, this previous answer. I know that everybody from Walmart is, is religiously disciplined about saying associate rather than employee. Can you explain the whole connotation of, of that? Sure. It goes back to Sam Walton and the feeling that someone that works for you is your partner or part of the company. I mean, I, I started in the hourly yeah. ranks. So many other people I could tell you about started in the hourly ranks. In the U.S., 70% of our store managers started as an hourly, might have started as a cashier or yeah. pushing carts. So it's really about we're all in this thing together. That's the, the point and why we use that term. Um, I have this is another international question, not directly related to your responsibility, but I'm sure you know about it. That over the last year or two, global supply chain issues have become more and more uh, a prominent question. At one of the opening sessions last night, the designer from, <clears throat> from Apple was saying people should get to know the insides of their machine. <clears throat> Apple has suffered a lot of bad press in the last year for, for aspects of its supply chain in China. Can you tell us where you think Number one, why Walmart has gotten involved in issues of environmentalism and supply chain safety, especially in China, where you think you've been successful and where you haven't. You know, what we should know about your efforts to improve the supply chain and use that as a lever on environmental and safety issues. Yeah. Well, I think it starts with the idea of transparency and that you know, I want to be proud to work at Walmart. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit up here in front of you or go talk to my grandmother and not be proud of what, what's happening at Walmart. So that means all the way through to the factories in every country where we source. So we have standards, other retailers have standards. I've walked a lot of factories and, and one of the things that we've seen in the past is that there was a standard for Walmart, there was a standard for a retailer A, B, yeah. C, D, and if you're the factory owner, you're kind of pulling your hair out. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things that's happened is more industry simplification, which I think has helped in the area of, of execution. We believe that the suppliers who do the best job on compliance, that do the best job of paying overtime when they over, owe overtime, are also the people that deliver on time and make the best quality. So we're really interested in quality factory selection. Um, we change suppliers from time to time, and that's where our risk mm -hmm. is. So if you ask, what do you not do well? I think keeping an eye on how many suppliers we have, and with new ones coming on board, are we onboarding them well? Mm -hmm. And not giving up on a factory when they have a shortcoming. I mean, one of the mistakes of the past that people have made is if you have a factory that you don't have a longstanding relationship with and you find some sort of infraction, you got two choices. You can pull out of the factory, or you can engage with the factory and help train them and teach mm -hmm. them. And so that's a constant battle for us is figuring out, and we have a program in place for whether you're red, yellow, or green and how much tolerance you get, and it depends on the issue, it depends on how many offenses, et cetera. But what we're trying to do is improve mm -hmm. the overall supply chain process. 
and, and with the idea that eventually everybody's going to know everything. So if you want to shine a light on any place in our supply chain, we want you to like what you find, and I want to like what I find. Um, so that's, that's the way yeah. that we approach it. And are there illustrations you can give us of where you think there's been a difference in you know, a certain kind of toxic pollutant in southern China or, or stories you're aware of where you were able to switch to a, a better or safer part of the supply chain? Yeah, we, we, I think we've had some success removing yeah. toxins. We've had some success. Uh, if I think of sustainable ag for a second, let me, let me talk about sustainable yeah. ag for a second and right. then factories because food is so much a part of this. We don't believe on the nine billion number that you can feed the world if you don't engage small and medium mm -hmm. farm uh, holders in the right way. And so we bought a business a few years ago in Central America and they did a great job of embracing small farmers. They helped them learn how to use water, how to use pesticides, helped them get to market faster, made them more efficient. And we've been taking that learning from Central America and trying to spread it everywhere. And so I've been on farms in China, in Costa Rica, in Africa, some really small farm, really small farms, almost garden-like, if you want to think about what it looks like to you. And helping them figure out how to get to market, make 10 to 15% more because we disintermediated mm -hmm. the middleman and got it to the store faster. Customer gets a fresher product, a local product, et cetera. There's a winning equation there. Um, on the factory side, um, we have, as I said before, tried to do a better job of, of selecting quality suppliers. And we use something called sustainable value networks on different subjects, mm -hmm. toxins being one of them to try and work with NGOs and government to set policy well. I mean, when we engaged in this sustainability effort in a different way, we're not scientists, and we and there was a debate then about packaging yeah. and, you know, the, uh, and corn, and do you, do you use this for packaging, or what's mm -hmm. oil, what's better, ethanol, et cetera. We don't know that stuff, we're retailers. So what we've had to do is open up and through these sustainable value networks, let other people influence us, try to use good judgment about where we set policies, and it's those policies that downstream make a difference in yeah. factories. Just ask you about one of those, which I think, which I saw in China, I haven't seen that much publicity here, the change in the packaging edict that you had for the supply chain. Can you say about the, the targets you were giving for people to reduce the amount of sort of waste packaging they used? Yeah, we, when we started our sustainability efforts, we set three big goals. One of them was to be um, supplied by renewable energy, um, we wanted to sell more sustainable products and more sustainable packaging, and we wanted to have zero waste. So we're making progress on zero waste. We're making progress on energy. We're using LED lighting in stores mm -hmm. more. We're um, in, in some countries, we're up to 80, 90 percent of the removal of, of things that would have gone into the landfill. Mm -hmm. So waste is a big area of focus. But on the product and packaging side, we have a packaging scorecard. We set expectations for our suppliers to reduce their packaging by certain percentages, mm -hmm. sometimes by category. And what we've learned is that the connection, the overlap maybe of uh, financial, social, and environmental sustainability is a sweet spot that actually takes cost out of the system. Huh. You know, some of our suppliers would like to have a huge package that takes up a lot of space on the shelf because they want you to see their brand. So it's not very efficient. So we, with our mindset, have been setting expectations and getting some of that stuff tightened up, even getting rid of these little metal ties that drive you crazy yeah. in the toy department because when you add all that stuff up, it was really a significant negative from a carbon point of view. So those kinds of decisions mm -hmm. and policy are what we're focused on. So I have one more question of my own. I'm going to then uh, invite you all to come to the microphones for questions from the floor. This is not so much international as back to uh, Walmart's uh, observations in the United States. The trends, these trends of the nine billion we've been discussing, we've seen two sort of contradictory economic phenomena around the world. There is this uh, growing global middle class, as you've said, which is part of your customer base around the world, but also in almost every country I'm aware of, the distribution of everything has been getting more unequal. The, that you have, um, you have the countries as a whole are getting rich, but a lot of the benefits are going to the very top, and people in the bottom half or the bottom third are under increasing pressure. That's been a phenomenon in the United States over the last 20 or 25 years, a richer country, but the median income more or less flat. Walmart is in a unique position to observe this, because often the pressures on the lower half of the American income distribution, are th these affect your customers, what they buy more of, what they buy less of, who enters your customer base if they hadn't been there before. What do you know about the distribution of income in America now, the sense of opportunity for people who at the moment are feeling uh, left out, the ways in which American, the American socioeconomic system is different now from, say, when you started with the company uh, in the 1980s? 
Uh, in the U.S., yeah. there was a bit of an inflection point around Easter. Mm -hmm. um, we, our research shows, and we would define a lower income customer in the United States at $35,000 or below. Mm -hmm. And our research, research shows that around Easter time, there was a level of optimism that changed. And I don't know mm -hmm. how much of it's related to gas prices yeah. or other, other factors, but lower income customers have felt better lately. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that show up in their purchasing. But there are a lot of Americans that are struggling to, to put food on the table. And we're trying to do the best job we can of serving them. Yeah. And you know, some of them may be on government assistance programs and their, their programs get activated at midnight. The cash is placed in on their card at midnight and we'll see them literally shopping at midnight. Mm. And um, you know, some may be in there buying baby formula at 12.01 and we can see that in our yeah. transactions. So back to our purpose, our purpose is to save people money so they can live yeah. better. And when I'm talking to my children about my job and my career, that's a sense mm -hmm. of pride for me that we're fighting for the person who needs to be fought for yeah. as it relates to, to price. Now, we want our associates to be well paid. In the U.S., we pay more than $5 on the average associate above the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. We have a health care program where you can get a, a $15 a month um, a payment to get health care. We're trying to make health care affordable. We want to have great jobs. We want to have career opportunities, but our purpose is also to save people money so they yeah. can live better. That's what we do for customers. That's our proposition, and I'm proud of that. Yeah, great. So I have more questions, but I'm going to give you all a chance. So yes, over here, and I think there are there. Yes, a microphone. Yes, there you go. And would you identify yourself, please? Yes, my name is Mike Pack. Thank you for for being here, and it's a great uh, great presentation. Um, wonderful thing about the Ideas Festival is you come up with ideas. I was here a couple years ago at a another event, and we started talking about healthcare. And the guy, the moderator, or the, the, uh, uh, the person on stage goes, I have an idea. What if Walmart put a, a center, a, a, a medical center, not, not an urgent care, but a, a clinic in each of their stores, they're centrally, they're located throughout the area that would accommodate people that maybe could not afford health care. I'm not talking about open heart surgeries, but I'm talking about the mom that comes in with, you know, the ear infection or the or the kid with the you know, sprained ankle. And I think that would be a tremendous relief for the uh, for the emergency uh, 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 centers in the hospitals throughout throughout the country. And I just wondered, since you're here, if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, it it is a, a good idea, and we and others have been doing it. Um, we've got some clinics in our stores now, and we've had some success with it. Finding the right providers that provide the service that we want to be provided, the quality of service on the hours, et cetera, has been one of the things we've been working through. But not only um, Walmart, but others. In fact, there was an article in the paper recently about, I think it may have been in the New York Times too, about the race to create those clinics and even more stores. So it's a great idea. We'd like to do it, and, we, and our customers value it. We just want to make sure that when we do it, that we, we do it really well. Uh, yes, over here, Shelley. Thanks, Shelley Porges, Director of the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the State Department. First of all, I want to commend Walmart for your leadership in supplier diversity, um, not only here in the United States, uh, getting women into the global supply chain, but also in other countries. And thank you very much for the support you've given us in the pilot we have down in Latin America, certifying women-owned businesses to enter global supply chain. In fact, we have some of our first contracts with Walmart.com, so thank you. That said, we know that the need is tremendous. And a question for you is, how can we accelerate the integration uh, of small, in general, small entrepreneurs, but uh, beyond that, women entrepreneurs into the global supply chain, given how you know, vast an impact Walmart really has globally? Yeah, I think there is an opportunity for, for public-private partnership and also just collaboration across entities. I was, I was talking to Dina Powell at Goldman Sachs last night about the program that they have, and she has identified some entrepreneurs that we need to be buying from. Um, one of them in particular we were talking about last night in India. So I think our job is to make sure we continue to tell people that we are accessible, we are interested, and then with other organizations continue to communicate. And sometimes it is as specific as there is this person in New Delhi making this item, will you buy it? And creating an environment where our buyers are incented to do that and accessible is one of the things that, that I'm focused on. Thank you. Yes. Amen. 
Hi, you represent your company so well. It makes and would you identify? Sorry. Oh, Joni Liebeck, yes. hi. Um, makes, you wanna, makes me want to buy more of your stock. But in any case, <laughs> some of us were at the last panel on the Arab Spring, and they talked about the role of business in um, social and economic entrepreneurship in Egypt and how to try to influence in a positive way trade and hope. And I was wondering, are, when you see world events, do you target a particular country because you know that there's a role you can play in assisting? Do you work with the government? Um, what are your thoughts about helping in the Arab Spring so it's not an Arab winter? That's my first question. Just on the side, there was a wonderful film last year on the at Film Fest about how giving farmers in Africa and um, fishermen cell phones allowed them to compete more aggressively at the marketplace and how it helped them individually. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't currently have any stores in Egypt or the Middle East, and typically our sourcing follows our stores. So someday we may be there, but we don't have any short-term plans to be there. We've tried a little bit of strategic sourcing over the years, and I wouldn't rule it out. And if there's a great supplier in Egypt, we, we would want to take a look at them. But we don't actively engage in that. We're more local in nature. Um, quick story on your second part of your question. Um, last year, I got the chance to go to Zambia and go to one of these small for farms outside of Lusaka. And there's a guy there named Dale Lewis who works for a, an NGO called Kamako that he founded. He was there to save elephants, elephants originally, but he figured out he couldn't stop poaching unless the poachers had higher income levels. So he started teaching people how to farm. And the next level of what he needed was communication with those farmers so they could get information, and et cetera. And so we've helped with some radios, um, things to help with communication, in addition to buying some of the product and putting it in some of our stores. So we love those kinds of, of stories and examples. Um, we work with a lot of large suppliers, but it, this, this other level that we're talking about is actually more rewarding. And a quick follow-up before the next question. Why don't you have stores in the Middle East? Um, just haven't gotten there yet. Um, we can't do everything at once. <laughs> we have to run a business, and um, we, we really started, as you know, in the U.S., have made acquisitions throughout Latin America, and our, our M&A approach is to, to enter large, high-growth markets. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're focused on right now is that, and yeah. a country at a time, yeah. at the right pace. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Xin Yu Li from China Friendship Association, and uh, uh, Walmart in China has been for you know many years. Uh, in your opinion, what is the advantage and the disadvantage for Walmart in China by comparison with uh, Walmart in other market except I mean outside the United States? And then second question is, uh, uh, what is most concerned issue for Walmart in China market? Thank you. Um, we have a great team in Walmart China. We, we started there with one store in Shenzhen in 1996, I believe it was, and have now grown. And we have a, a lot of experienced people there, and they're very good item merchants. And what that means to us is when I visit the stores there, our associates will grab me by the arm and take me over and show me an item and tell me a story about how they're selling more of that product. They're entrepreneurial in nature, and they have taken to Walmart culture in a very uh, effective way. Um, my biggest opportunity in Walmart China, biggest room to improve? Disadvantage. Um, one of the disadvantages that we've had in China is that pre-WTO, we were required to open one store per city. So it spread us out, which is a logistical disadvantage for us. And now China is going through a process of, of some aggregation or centralization in its supply chain, which will help with food safety and other issues. It's, it's too complex and too distributed. And so not only Walmart, but suppliers in China are thinking about how can we make improvements in the supply chain to better deliver on things like food safety and in stock because of supply chain. It's going to go through another phase of change, largely and, geographic. And a brief follow on that. Um, in, in China, to the best of my knowledge, Walmart is second to Carrefour as a, re, as a big retail outlet. Is that a unique Chinese situation or how, does that happen in other parts? No, it happens country? in other places. Uh -huh. You know, we, we, we weren't number one in the United States yeah. in 1970. Uh -huh. it, you, we start with one store and our focus is on one great store at a yeah. time, one great customer experience at a time, and then size mm -hmm. works itself out. It's more about being the best and there are markets around the world where we're not the largest, yes. which is uh, fine. Yes, over here. Yes, sir. 
Hi, uh, Kip Tyndall. I'm with the Container Store, and um, I'm also involved with the National Retail Federation. And so we know that you know one in four American workers are involved uh, work in retail, and one in eight of those actually work for Walmart, you know, which is just amazing and, and I think uh, wonderful. Um, kind of excluding Mexico and China, what, what what country do you have the deepest penetration like that with, and and, and why? And 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 what what is that number? would you estimate in China or Mexico if, the, if that's the one that you have the, the next deepest penetration to? But I'm really looking for that sleeper, you know, is it India or Poland, and, and why do you think that is? Yeah, our numbers outside the U.S. would all be a lot smaller than they, than they are here. And in general, um, where we've been longer, we look more like that, we have more penetration, et cetera. So we've been in Mexico and Canada for longer, and, and we have more developed businesses there, and they're great. The ones to watch out for, the ones that are going to grow and really be more important over time, would start with China and then Brazil. And then also, personally, I'm very excited about what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the investment that we made uh, just last year, almost a year ago now, of a company called MassMart, which is a multi-country. They're in 12 different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, multiple format retailer. They have a do-it-yourself uh, retail business, something like Ho uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. They have food stores, uh, discount stores. Um, that area of the world is going to be increasingly important over the next 5, 10, and, and 20 years for a number of reasons. And so I think that's an area from an investment point of view to, to keep an eye on. I'm, I'm bullish as it relates to Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Thank you. Another question at the same table. Yes. Gordon Siegel, um, how do you um, look at the Amazon uh, threat in terms of what they're able to do in getting into much more commodity products than they first started with. First they were in books and then they were more selective and now they're delivering much more commodities without sales tax and certainly free delivery. How does that impact uh, Walmart and what steps are you taking to address Amazon? Yeah, it's a mistake on my part to let this much of the conversation go by without talking about the internet. I'm glad you asked about that because it's changing everything and, and with speed. Um, they're a terrific competitor, but there are other terrific competitors too, especially um, when you look at it internationally. Um, and some of the fastest growth rates are coming out of, of e-commerce players. Um, we've made some investment, but recently have been making more. Um, this capability of being able to serve the customer either online directly or in a multi-channel type of manner where they can order online, pick up in the store, get product information, um, you, the use of mobile, um, if you haven't tried our iPad app, please take a look at the Walmart iPad app. Those things are hugely important. Um, we've made acquisitions as it relates to, to social commerce. We've made acquisitions as it relates to other digital capabilities to try and, and catch up and quickly become more effective as it relates to, to selling merchandise online. There are opportunities for us to leverage our existing assets, to leverage our logistics network in this country and in others. And it's very different around the world. The U.S. is in one position, but China, from an Internet point of view, is, is an incredible story of growth. And we have a minority investment there today in a company called eHowdian that we've asked for government approval to buy a majority, a majority stake in. So we're, we're growing. We're focused on it. And our primary focus, more than being on what competition's doing, which we have kind of in our peripheral vision, is what does a customer want us to do? And how do we do that more effectively? And, and it is a transformational change for us and for other retailers. It's a big deal. So we have the lady in the black in the far back and then gentleman here. He's first in the back. Could you wait for just a second for the microphone? Thank you. My name is Eve Malab. I'm here from Australia. It seems to me that one of the biggest unmet demand for a product for women is access to a simple, cheap contraceptive which can be sold over the counter. I was wondering if this is something where Walmart would take a lead. That's the first time I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I might, ju might just say the distribution of contraceptives is basically left to not-for-profit organisations who are really, really very good but don't have the... Um, the tools that their example that their, um, that Walmart has. Well, it's an ideas festival, and I think you just <laughs> gave me one. Yeah. So let let us go back and think about what we could do there. Appreciate you bringing Great. that up. Thank you. <laughs> Great. A gentleman here, yes. 
Uh, and wait for the microphone, please. Hi, I'm John Rogers from San Francisco. I wanted to circle back to your comments about educational programs for your associates. And can you sort of articulate for us how much of that is about recruitment versus retention versus advancement? How much you think about insourcing that versus outsourcing that? I know in this country you thought about buying a university, then you announced a partnership with the American public. So if you can kind of summarize what your approach is and what your goals are, yeah. that'd be interesting. I'll try to do that briefly, but there is a lot going on, and it does vary a lot by geography. You know, different things in emerging markets are needed than are needed in developed markets. But it's primarily around uh, recruitment and then development because we want to, as I mentioned earlier, have as many of our leaders come from inside the company as we can. In some cases, um, India is the first place that comes to mind, but it's true in other places too. There literally is not a customer service uh, workforce waiting to be employed. So we have to start at hello. And if you went through our materials, our curriculum in India, and looked at the very basic business education that we're doing in some of these markets, it would demonstrate for you how much opportunity there is just to cause people to understand they can have a different kind of career with a company like Walmart, and they're, they're not all going to have to be in the informal market or, or working on a farm, et cetera. So um, I mentioned the social retail school in, in Brazil. We have the uh, joint venture partnership with the Bardi uh, folks in India where we're doing uh, work together. We have some things underway in, in China with the university. We have the programs that you just mentioned in the United States. And what we're trying to do is, is to make sure that we're ready to hire and retain 500,000 people. Um, within the 2.2 million population, we've got 300,000 people that have been with the company for more than 10 years. We'd like to see that number go up. Um, and we need a lot of capable store managers, and we need more talent in the area of technology and the internet. So we're working the, the advanced level, but also this large population of people with those kinds of programs. And if you have any great ideas on what we could do better, please grab me afterwards and let me know. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes, over here. My name is Julio Picard, and I'm from Mexico. So I understand that after the bribery scandal, like company-wise, you took some measures like increasing compliance, etc. But I wonder what Walmart did, like community-wise. Uh, we we have a very well-developed foundation in Mexico, and they engage on everything from sourcing to charitable giving. Um, so, you know, in the U.S., um, this this last year with cash and in-kind gifts, our charitable giving number was close to a billion dollars, with about 400 million of that being in cash. Mexico, in proportionate terms, is about the same, if I recall. So there's a, a well-established, broad effort in terms of charitable giving in Mexico. It's one of our um, best examples of foundation giving outside the United States. Uh, same table, yes. Thank you. Jonathan Halperin with Designing Sustainability. And I really want to like Walmart, and I'm, I don't, at least not yet. So here are the two concerns. One is that in the effort to save money, Walmart may not only drive down costs, but may push them out into the future, such that costs end up getting paid by our kids and our grandkids, because they're not internalized now from a sustainability perspective. The second is related to your comment about the African, I think it was small landowner, and saving them 10 to 15% by eliminating the middleman. Middlemen are easy to sort of eliminate and not like, no, nobody likes the idea of a middleman, but in that kind of a situation, if that farmer then has no option to sell to anybody else, you can then have a lot of market power in determining the price you'll pay because there's nobody left that they can sell to other than you. I don't know if you'll like Walmart, but I'll just keep telling you the truth and you can decide for yourself. Um, relative to small farmers, Disintermediating middlemen is not something that we control exclusively. So if I think of China as a good example, we're working with farmers and co-ops, and what we're trying to establish in some cases is a cold storage facility for them near their farms or co-ops so that their goods don't go to waste, and then they get moved quickly to the store. The other method of distribution that they can still use, because those middlemen still exist, there are still crops going to market that through that way our share is not that high, um, are not as efficient. And if I think of a market like India with this FDI debate, you know, 40% of fruit and vegetables are going to waste. Walmart can't solve that problem. Modern retail can't solve that problem. But we can make a difference. 
And so I would argue that, that Walmart's impact in that respect is more positive than the old way of doing business or the informal market. And I feel the way, same way about sustainability. Um, Walmart is not yet sustainable. We will keep having big goals. We will keep working to try and make progress every day from a sustainability point of view. I was in the UK on Friday and our buyer was excited to show me a new wine pouch. We have our own bottling facility in the UK for wine. It moves in big containers from South Africa to the UK and it gets bottled. But this wine pouch has an 80% smaller carbon footprint. The smaller retailers in some markets are not working on that. And we are. So when I look at it, the, we are not perfect, but we are a force for good and things are better because we're there. That's what we're working to try and, and demonstrate to all of our customers and, um, and to people like you. So I'll keep working on it. We have time for one short last question, which will be here. Uh, yeah, and wait for the microphone. Uh, it's two, but they're both quick. Okay, but uh, microphone, uh, hold on a sec. Wait, wait just a second, please. There we go. Your supply uh, uh, chain uses an awful lot of water. An awful lot of water. Are you tracking it? And uh, what are you doing about it? You could throw energy in, into yeah. that if you wanted to also. And then I'd like to hear one thing you don't like about Walmart. And okay. what are you not doing well? Okay. If you, if you think of Most of those get written about in a paper. You hear about those. <laughs> um, on, the, on the water side, um, from a sustainability point of view, in as straightforward manner as I can describe it, we're not as good at water yet. Our policies and our thinking is not as advanced as it is in some other areas. We're, right now, frankly, we're better at energy. Building stores that are more efficient than the stores before, for example. So we need to improve in that area. And I walked around a super center not long ago after a discussion with one of our suppliers and looked at just how much water is in our products. You may or may not know that a few years ago, Walmart led an effort to take water out of detergent. Detergent sizes became more concentrated. P&G, Unilever, and Walmart led that effort, and then the whole industry moved. It's an example of where scale can be used for good. It wouldn't have happened if we hadn't said, we're gonna make that happen. And there was a risk associated with it because of customer perception of value. So we took that risk, we made it happen, and it worked out. But there are lots of other products in our stores. I was looking at spray cleaners, for example, with one of our suppliers, and we're trying to figure out how do you develop a concentrate bottle where you can have a concentrate plug-in, you add the water at home, and stop shipping all this water around. Um, and so we'll look for places like that laundry detergent where we can step forward and do that. Um, what do I not like about Walmart? Um, we work really hard, um, and things aren't perfect. And I don't mean to sit here and make them, make them sound like they are perfect, and I'm actually not trying to sell you anything, um, except maybe our share price if you do want to buy more Walmart stock. But, um, um, making sure that 2.2 million people have the right culture and do the right thing is a big part of our challenge. Uh, one story maybe to tell you the example. Uh, we were in the UK on Friday, and every market around the world right now is really focused on compliance, as you would expect. And in the UK, they took a Coke can and they put it in the atrium of our home office in Asda House. So if you walk through the front door of our home office in Leeds, England, there's this open area with stairwells where the offices are. And they took a can of Coke at 7 a.m. and they put it on the floor. And then they had a hidden camera to see how long it took for someone to pick it up. And they called it the Don't Walk By program. If you see something wrong, say something about it, for example. So the uh, the clock runs to 7.20, and you see people walk by this thing, large numbers of people, dozens of people, and you see one person actually stop, look at the Coke can, and keep walking. There is nothing else on the floor. It's spotless, but that Coke can does not get picked up until 7.20. And at 7.20, you see this guy in a suit come in, and he walks by, he sees the Coke can, he picks it up, he walks over to the recycling area, he drops it, it's out of his way, but he drops it, and then he goes on to work. Well, the person who picked it up was our CEO. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know the test was going on. But what I worry about is why did it take 20 minutes and why did it take our CEO to pick up that Coke can? So, you know, I've got it, we've got to make sure that everyone all the time, um, when, when no one's looking, is doing the right thing. We're going to end this with a show of hands poll. We believe in, Walmart believes in quantifying things. We're going to do it here. The three choices are going to be 
you think better of Walmart than you did an hour ago, you think worse of Walmart no. than you did an hour ago, or you think the same. You didn't tell me you were going to do I this. I know, I just thought it up. Okay, so how many people, and you can close your eyes for one, I'll tell you the result. So how many people think better of Walmart than they did an hour ago? How many people think worse of Walmart than they did an hour ago? How many people are unchanged? I think there's been a, a successful and worthwhile uh, uh, hour in many ways, but please join me in thanking Doug McMillan for his wonderful contribution. Thanks, John. Nice to meet you.